uh, last week, my wife and I, we celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary, if you can believe that. Yeah, thank you. 18 years, 18 years. And my wife posted a picture of our wedding day, and someone commented on it and said, Tara, you have not changed one single bit, exclamation point, and said nothing about me. And so I, I was a little offended by that. You know, I was a little offended. But, you know, no, she hasn't changed. I'm the one who has changed. But I will tell you this. Uh, one, somebody asked me recently, is there anything about marriage that surprised you? That surprised you? Like, you didn't know going into it. And, and I would say this. This definitely surprised me. I had no idea that marriage would involve this many coffee cups. I, I just didn't know that that could ever equate to this many coffee cups. My wife has 58 coffee mugs, and she drinks out of two of them. I swear to you. She drinks out of two. It's like clean and dirty, and they just rotate, and the other 58 just stay in there. And it was probably about a year ago that my wife bought this new mug set, and it was sitting on the counter, and I took a picture of it so you could see it, and it looked just like this. And she has a little coffee station because my wife is fanatical about coffee. She goes to bed dreaming about her cup of coffee in the morning. Anybody else fanatical about coffee? Any, okay, there's a few of you weirdos in here. All right, that's all right. That's good. And so she had this nice mug set, and for, for a few months, I noticed that she was not drinking any out of those out of those mugs. And so there was one day she said, can you get me a, a mug? And I said, sure. And so I went to grab it, and she said, no, honey, not that mug, the mug in the cupboard. And I said, I don't, why can't we use this cup? And she, she said, no, 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 these mugs are not for drinking. These mugs are for looking at. And it was in that moment I thought, what has my life become? I don't even understand anything anymore, but apparently those are just looking mugs. You know, I just go, what is the point? Why was the point of having mugs if you don't even drink out of them? And as I was thinking about this series that we're in, uh, we're in week five of the series, Names of God. Uh, we're walking through seven Hebrew names of God. And I do believe that in the same way we like the, with the mugs, there's a lot of people that they approach God in the same way. That he's good to maybe look at from a distance, but never to use in my life. And yet, as we've gone through this series, I hope what has been evident is that there's a God in heaven who loves you, who knows you, who sees you, and wants to be an integral part of your daily life. He is a personal God, not a God who is distant and just wants to be looked at from afar, but a God that wants to walk with you every single day. And that's what this series is all about, discovering the names of God, because we believe that these names help reveal his character and helps us then apply those things, the character of God, into our life as well. And we believe this, the very first filling on your notes, that God's name has value because it encompasses who he is. God's name has value because it encompasses who he is. And today, the name of God that we're exploring is this, Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha, and as we've talked about before in this series, this word Jehovah means Lord or existing one. Jehovah Rapha, but Rapha, the next part on your notes here, the word Rapha means to restore, to heal, to make healthful in Hebrew. That's what this word Rapha means. So together, Jehovah Rapha, your next fill in, the Lord who heals. The Lord who heals. And it's an attribute of God. The great physician who heals our physical bodies, who heals our emotions, right, our mental state, our relational state, all of those things, God wants to step in and bring health and wholeness and healing into our lives. And this word and this phrase, Jehovah Rapha, this name of God is actually discovered first in Exodus chapter 15, where we pick up this story where Moses, I mean, is fresh off of uh, rescuing all of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So three days now, he has led all of these Israelites out of the land of Egypt into the desert, and it's been three days, and guess what they've had none of? They've had nothing to drink in three days. Now, how many of you think that after three days in the desert, you'd be ready for something to drink, right? And all of a sudden, in the distance, they see a body of water. 
Now, they tell us that there could have been up to 2 million Israelites that were on this journey. And as you can imagine, if you've ever seen the cartoons of the people in the desert who are nearly dying and they see a mirage, they see the oasis, they see the water. I wonder if these people thought, I am losing my mind because I see a body of water that we can drink from. And if you can imagine hundreds of thousands of people rushing to this body of water only to discover that it was not drinkable water. There really was a body of water. It just wasn't drinkable. Now, I don't know how they figured this out. Maybe they said, hey, we need a few teenagers, a couple volunteers real quick. Come on down. And they drank some and they passed out and died. I don't know how they figured it out. But they knew the water wasn't drinkable. So what did they do? Several of them went to Moses and said, Moses, I hope your plan all along hasn't been to bring us out here just so we can die in this desert. I mean, I really hope that you have a plan. I hope it wasn't just to deliver us from Egypt and now you've got nothing, Moses. Please tell us that you have a plan. So what did Moses do? He prayed and said, God, what are we to do? And God said to him, do you see that piece of wood over there laying on the ground? Moses said, yep. He says, I want you to throw that into the lake, and then the lake will be drinkable. Now, I mean, I think you could have a pretty significant relationship with God and still have doubts in the back of your mind. God, so you're telling me that if I throw this piece of wood into this water, that suddenly it's going to be drinkable. And he did. So he went over and he picked up the the wood. He goes, I guess I got nothing to lose, right, except for my life. These people are going to kill me if I don't give them something to drink. And he lifts up the piece of wood, right, and I'm sure he tells the people, listen, people, here's my plan. My plan is we're going to throw this piece of wood into the water. It's going to become drinkable, and I can only imagine the groans, the eye rolls, the like, are you kidding me? This is the best plan that you have, Moses. And he did just that. He threw it into the water. And I don't know what happened in that moment. I don't know if they saw some bubbling. I don't know if they saw it become like crystal clear. I don't know if they called for two more teenage volunteers to have another drink. I don't know what they did. But all of a sudden, a miracle happened, and that water became drinkable. And the children of Israel drank that day. And it was in that moment that God spoke to Moses, and he said this to the people, that if you thought that was something, Keep following after me, and here's what you will discover, that I am not only a God who will provide for you, but I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who will heal you. And it was a beginning for these people to see the miraculous at work, the unbelievable happen in front of their eyes, and we believe today that he is still the Lord who heals. He is still Jehovah Rapha. Now you might say, now Ryan, I thought that that was just the kind of thing that was for back in biblical times. I mean, does God really still heal today? Does God really still do it? I mean, the miraculous. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to know, right? We, we have so many great doctors and medicines and all these things, and we're so grateful for that. But especially in third world countries where they don't have much of that at all, they really are relying on God's supernatural power to heal them. And about 20 years ago, I got to go to India with my dad. And uh, my dad uh, runs a missions ministry that helps drill freshwater wells and builds churches. And they would have services and they'd pray for people who were sick and all of that. And on this trip 20 years ago or so, I was with him. And we were at one of these services where we said, if you need prayer for your body, if you need healing, we want to pray for you to be healed. And as God is my witness, a boy who is about 10 or 11 years old, got out of a wheelchair after we had prayed for him and other people had prayed for him that night in the service and he walked across the front of that room. I kid you not. It was absolutely mind-blowing. His legs were shaking as he walked but had never walked in his entire life. We watched as a woman who was blind in one eye that night received her vision back in the eye. And we went to the leaders, we went to the pastors, we went to the people in this community and said, was this boy really lame since birth? Was this woman really unable to see out of one eye? And they said, absolutely they were. This is God's miraculous healing. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And in that moment, we prayed 
We prayed this prayer of faith. God, would you do what only you can do? And it was the same prayer and faith that the prophet Jeremiah had in Jeremiah 17, 14 when he said this. This was his prayer of faith. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. I mean, you just had that faith. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are the one I praise. In other words, Jeremiah the prophet is saying, you are the one who heals. You are the one who saves. You're the one who I've got my confidence in. You are the one who's able to do what no one else can do, and I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. Jehovah Rapha, the one who healed and still heals today, and we can have that same faith. We can have this same faith Speaking of faith, the the brother of Jesus, James, wrote the book of James, and in this book, he begins to ask some real practical questions and eventually gets around to this whole topic of healing. And you've heard me ask this question before, and I'll probably ask it every single time, every time we talk about James, the brother of Jesus. But the question is this, what would it do for your brother or sister to convince you that they were the son of God? How many of you have siblings? What would it take for your brother or sister to convince you that they were the son of God. Some of you would say, not a chance, right? I mean, hell would have to freeze. How many of you are on that lane, line of thought, right? Hell would have to freeze over before I believe that my siblings were the son of God. Uh, and, and James was probably in the same mental battle. And the one thing that changed it for him and changed it for everything and is the reason that we're here today is because James saw his brother die and three days later saw him alive. It was the one thing that changed everything for him that he, the brother of Jesus, then believed that he was the Son of God. You talk about faith, a faith that can change your life. And James, in the fifth chapter, is talking about faith and talking practically about what we should do when we're facing hardships. And he begins to ask this all practical question. James 5.13, he asks this question. Are any of you suffering hardships? Are any of you suffering hardships? Now, you can fill in the blank on hardships. Maybe it's divorce. Maybe it's death of a loved one. Maybe it's the loss of a job. The betrayal of a friend. A failure in your own life. Maybe it's a crisis you're trying to manage. And he asks, are any of you suffering hardships? Because if you are, I'm about to give you the answer of what you need to do. He says, if you are suffering hardships, you should, what's that word? There it is. You should, what's that word? Pray. You should pray. James says the very first step in handling the hardships in life, especially that come with pain and suffering, is not to pretend that everything's okay. That's not the first step. It's not getting on the social media and venting to everybody. That's not the first step. It's not grabbing another drink. That's not the first step, right? It's not on going a bunch of shopping sprees. No, no, no. James says that if you are facing hardships, your next fill-in, our first response should be prayer. Our first response should be prayer. That we'd bring it to God and say, God, I know that you see this situation. God, I know you see what I'm facing. God, I know that you see what I'm going through. Just like we said just a moment ago, that not only do we see him and our eyes are on him, but he is a God who sees us. And he knows us. And we can take great comfort in that. And James says, if you're facing hardship, you should always begin with prayer. That commercial, I used to love Hotels.com. Do you remember when they'd have Captain Obvious on there? And Captain Obvious would point out, right, the things that we all already, the things we already knew. And James is kind of like Captain Obvious, that if you're facing hardship and if you're in a tough spot, you should try praying. Like, hello, like that would be a good thing to do. That would be a good place to start. And then James asked this next question. In verse 14, he says, are any of you sick? Are any of you sick? Is there anybody that has chronic pain? 
on constant medication or physical therapy? Are you needing a surgery? Are are you battling something connected to mental health or physical health or relational health or emotional health? James asked the question, are you sick? And if so, this is what he says to do. He continues. He said, you should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord, And such a prayer offered in, what's that word? Faith. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. Now there's a couple things that I want to point out about this verse, especially if you're newer to church or newer to faith. You may not understand this whole idea of like elders and oil inside. Let me just talk about that for a minute. Um, Elders can be referenced Um, To anybody, really, who has been following Jesus longer than you have, that could be an elder, or it could also be a reference to someone who is a spiritual leader in the church. Maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a small group leader, someone that you look up to in the faith or, you know, has some sort of role in the church. That could be an elder. Uh, And and it encourages you to have those people pray over you. And then this word oil, it's it's a little bit more complex. Uh, There's many places in the Bible where it reads about the practice of anointing someone with oil. And it's used at different times for different reasons. And uh, we know the, tr- the same is true today, that oil is used for lots of different various reasons, like health or cooking or aromatherapy, etc. Uh, but what's not clear is whether James is commanding us to anoint the sick with oil because it's like a medicine that they used at that time to help soothe the pain, or if it's a symbolic way of acknowledging God's presence or something cultural or something else. We don't really know. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on that today because what I want to do is really get to the bigger idea of this truth that God really still has the power to heal. God has the power to heal anything in your life. And we see this truth in the life of Jesus. And you may not know this, but over two-thirds of Jesus' ministry involved healing of some kind. In fact, when Jesus was just beginning his earthly ministry, here's what his disciple Matthew said about him in Matthew 4.23. He said this, that Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Every kind. Physical Spiritual, emotional, relational. He healed every kind of disease and illness in our life. And so the reality is, is that the teaching and ministry of Jesus, your next villain, can really be summarized in three words. It was teaching, it was preaching, and it was healing. It was teaching, it was preaching, and it was healing. These are the three things that Jesus did over and over and over again. He taught people, he preached to people, and he healed people. And this was just 2,000 years ago. And the eyewitnesses and the people of those times recorded these events down. I'm so grateful that we have these letters that have been preserved all of this time for us to understand the life and ministry of Jesus. And we get to read about the things that he did and how he lived his life. And let me just describe each one of these. He really was a teacher. Jesus explained the scriptures to people. He cared about educating people's minds and helping them understand the ways of God. Because so many of these ways of God that Jesus brought were so new. The concept was so foreign. And Jesus loved to teach people what it meant now to live in God. Secondly, he was a preacher. He proclaimed and announced and invited people to join the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that was coming to earth, he said, you can be a part of this. And Jesus, and people listened to Jesus preaching and they followed him. And lastly, he was a healer. He healed people. And this is your next fill-in, that Jesus restored and transformed people physically, 
mentally, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. That's what Jesus did. He restored and transformed people. Over and over again, we see in Scripture the times that he healed people's physical bodies. They healed them mentally or emotionally. We see that in Scripture, relationally, spiritually. And I know that even as we talk about healing, and you're here today or you're watching online, this whole idea of healing can be a very complex topic that is filled with mystery and ambiguity. Certainly complexity, like I said, and even misunderstanding. What is this whole healing thing really all about? And the reason that it's mysterious and the reason that it's complex and the reason it's ambiguous is because I think a lot of times what we want to do is connect our logical brain to all of these things. We want to connect the dots logically on everything. But the truth is, is that your brain and my brain will never ever be able to logically connect the dots of the supernatural. There are things in the natural that we can see, that we can understand, and then there are some things that are supernatural that God does that we just don't have any answer for. That our brains have a hard time catching up to because it goes against the natural. What do you mean a little boy who's never walked before could stand up and walk? How is that possible? The truth of the matter is, is while we are grateful for medicine and doctors and physical therapists, and counselors, and first responders. We're so grateful to live in a country where we have some of the best medical care in the world, the greatest technology. We recognize that all of those things have limitations. That medicine can only go so far. And counselors, or physical therapists, or physicians can only do so much. Then there are the things that only God can do. That only in his power and only in his will and only in his might that he can do. And so I want to take just the next two minutes to talk about three truths about miraculous healing. I want to break this down for you because at the end of the day, we're going to have an opportunity to pray for anybody who needs healing of any kind in their life. But there's three things first that I feel like I need to say to help unpack this for you. And this this is the filling on your notes. And the first one is this. This is important to understand that you can't buy healing. You can't buy healing from God. And if you've ever seen a TV preacher or if you ever hear a pastor say that if you give, a miracle will be attached to it, I want you to run as fast as humanly possible away from that. Nowhere in Scripture does it support that, that if you pay some money or you give a gift, that somehow it will give you healing. And I, there is a laundry list of people who have done it that are con artists and scam artists, and all they want to do is rip people off, and I'm telling you, it's not the truth. You cannot buy healing. The second thing is this that your level of faith doesn't guarantee healing. Your level of faith doesn't guarantee healing. Now, we just read that we operate in faith, right? We make a prayer of faith, absolutely. But where does that measure of faith rise or fall, right? How confident are you that God's going to heal you? Or sometimes people get caught up, or how much or little have I sinned? If I've sinned lately, maybe that's why, you know, I'm not going to get healed today because God, I, I sinned and I did something I shouldn't have. I don't have enough faith. Maybe I just need more faith. If I just had more faith, then maybe God would heal me. And I want to let you know that faith in God, while it's important for you to pray a prayer of faith and have faith that God can do it, it doesn't guarantee your healing. And if you could have just a little bit more faith, then maybe God would heal you. That's not what determines it, right? We need to believe that God can, even if we are unsure that he will. We have to believe that God can, even if we are unsure if he will. I can tell you that there are plenty of people that we read about in Scripture, plenty of people that endured suffering or pain or difficulty, and for whatever reason, they didn't receive the healing that they prayed for. I know of many people in my life who have prayed for healing. Some have been healed 
Uh, there was a couple that used to attend Riverway and they moved way up north and she had cancer. And over the last year, God miraculously healed and removed the cancer from her body. And the doctor said, it's a miracle. Only God could do this. But I know of many people who have prayed and they haven't received the healing. They haven't received what they long for, including the very people that James wrote this letter to. But none of this negates the final truth. And it's this, that God does heal. That God does heal. God is still a God who heals. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And while we are grateful for science and medicine, I think in America, we obviously take advantage of it, right? Because that's kind of our first step. When James says you need to first pray, what do we first do? We, sometimes we first call the doctor, don't we? We first go to urgent care. Rather than saying, God, I want to bring this to you first. And then there's other times we truly need a miracle of God. Some of you in this room today, you might need a miracle from God. Watching online, you might need a miracle from God. And I just think that there's a lot of miracles in our lives in general that we overlook. And some of you would say, I don't know that I believe in miracles, and yet you're sitting here and you're breathing, your lungs are functioning, your heart is beating, your ears are hearing, and your eyes are focusing, and you're not hooked up to any battery that I know of. It's a miracle that our bodies even do what they do. Or when someone surrenders their life to Jesus and begins to change their worldview, begins to surrender parts of their life to God that had never been surrendered before, they begin to change their thinking and patterns. I'm telling you what, that is a miracle of the soul, a miracle of the heart that oftentimes we overlook. And if I were to ask you, where were you 10 years ago when it came to your faith and your relationship with God? Where were you 20 years ago? What were you involved in that you are, by the grace of God, no longer involved in? It's been a miracle in our lives that God has done. Now, here's the reality of it. While I can give you those three truths, I know there are some that say, well, Ryan, just give me the simple antidote. Give me the equation that guarantees God's healing, and I wish I could, but I can't. I can't explain why sometimes God heals and restores in miraculous ways, and other times he chooses not to. I don't know. I wish I had an answer for that. I can't explain why sometimes God does things in an instant in someone's life, but will take decades to do in somebody else's. I don't. All that I know is that he does. He really does. And a faith that believed that God can still do the impossible, that he is still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And maybe for you, it's a physical healing Maybe it's a relationship or a marriage that needs healing. Maybe it's a healing of mental health or emotions or a broken heart. Whatever you're facing that needs healing, I'm here to tell you that we serve a God that loves us and still has the power to heal. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. It's not just physical. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's relational. That God has the power to do what we can't. Now here's the thing as we close. I can't guarantee anyone's healing. But what we can do is do what James, the brother of Jesus, told us to do. To pray. To offer up a prayer of faith and ask God to do what only he can do.